Let me now take the pleasure to welcome our, uh, the bishop who has come as our guest today. This is not his first time to be here, and we are so delighted that we can get him back to Uganda Christian University. Um, you already heard his name, at least partially mentioned in prayers. Uh, bishop Gary Nelson uh, comes to us from Western Australia. Now, I lived in Australia for five years. Uh, that is probably another country in its own right, Western Australia. It's a large, large area. But that's where he comes from, from uh, Bishop of Northwestern Australia. And uh, he has come, of course, with his wife. We are so glad to see you, Mrs. Christine uh, Nelson. We are delighted to see you here. Uh, but before becoming Bishop of Northwestern Australia, he was coordinator of Moore College. Now, Moore College, we've had some very good relationships in the past. And uh, in fact, our own Canon Dr. Lua actually did his PhD at Moore College, which is situated in Sydney. And so we are very happy that uh, we can have someone who has been there and we are connected in that way. And Moore College uh, definitely is a, a college uh, in as much as it's called a college, it's really, really an outstanding uh, Anglican college, and we are so thankful to that. Now, Bishop Gary pastored Panania Anglican Church in Sydney Diocese for 17 years, and uh, he's currently uh, visiting, also going to Karamoja Diocese, with whom uh, his diocese has a partnership. And so he'll be traveling there tomorrow, but we are so glad that we can receive you here and may God bless you and bless your word as uh, God's word as, he, as you bring it to us today. Thank you so much. God is good. Amen. All the time. Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can meet together. We thank you for the wonderful privilege it is to join together, to rejoice in what you've done, to hear your word, to sing your praises, to bring our prayers before you. And we pray now as we look to your word that you'll open our hearts and minds to it. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let me just... Uh, express my thanks to the Vice Chaplain, to the, the Vice Chancellor, to Chaplain Rebecca and of course to my good friend Alfred Olwa for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. It's a wonderful privilege and I'm thankful to God to being able to be here and it's a great joy for me too to have my wife with me. This is her first visit to Africa. She hasn't been able to come before and she's loving it. Well, friends, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? That's what I want to think about this morning. For to follow Jesus is to follow the King whose love took him to the cross. And in this last week, we've celebrated that, haven't we? We've celebrated his death for us, the only way in which we can have our sins forgiven. We've celebrated his magnificent coming back to life again as the empty tomb stared us in the face on Resurrection Sunday. And what a great joy to meet with people. Our first service was by the beach at 6am as we met together with people before the dawn to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But friends, if our King saves through the cross then it's no wonder he calls his disciples, his followers, to really be cross-shaped in their discipleship. And so Jesus says to his would-be disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I can't imagine a more challenging call to radical discipleship than those words. Can you? See, following Jesus isn't about power, but crucifixion. For the kingdom of God concerns a crucified king 
and a crucified people. And so we're called to radical living. See, if we're going to start following Jesus, we begin by denying ourselves. Denying ourselves. This is an incredible concept to get hold of, isn't it? To deny ourselves. We live in a world which doesn't tend to say deny yourself. But Jesus demands that. He demands something which is life transforming as we deny ourselves. As we say no to self-rule. As we say no to letting ourselves be the king of our own lives. Jesus demands from us that we turn away from a lifestyle dominated by selfishness. We're to decisively reject a worldview that places ourselves at the centre, living as if we control our destiny. How foolish. I can't even snap my fingers to stop the rain let alone control my destiny. See, the reality we live in is very different, isn't it? We're entangled in a world committed to rebelling against the Creator God. We live in a world with the devastating effect of sin in our world where we're captive to sin. So it's not surprising that when Jesus bursts onto the scene and starts publicly preaching, his first message calls people to repentance, to have that major U-turn in their lives. Yet the world that we live in is out of step with the living God. You've only got to listen to the news every day to be reminded of that very fact. And with all the advertising that comes to us, maybe you're not bombarded as much as what we are back in Australia, but boy, you can't turn a corner without being bombarded by advertising. Advertising which is saying, indulge yourself. You deserve it. Pamper yourself. You deserve it. You deserve happiness and wealth. But Jesus says... We need to abandon that if we're going to follow a crucified Jesus. So I wonder if we're conscious deep down of the times that our past selfishness invades us, where it still tempts us, tempts us about our present, tempts us about our futures. As we've had all those finalists out here on the on the stage. I wonder if we're aware of what our past may do to us as we leave this environment. The past can creep in, impacting the limits that we are prepared to deny ourselves for, to sacrifice for Christ. But if we're going to be a true disciple, then we have to forego ourselves for the sake of Jesus. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared? Are we prepared to be radical disciples? We need to keep checking our walk with Jesus, that we are living the way he wants. So he says, deny ourselves and then take up our cross. Sometimes we misunderstand what Jesus says when he says, take up your cross. He's not talking about some inconvenience or some temporary burden, but rather the image is there from the first century of someone carrying their cross. For the Romans when they came in and occupied the land of Israel, there was no mistaking what they meant by taking up your cross. And people had opportunity, ample opportunity, to see what the Romans meant 
by taking up your cross. For the cross was an instrument of pain and cruelty, stripping a person of all human dignity, encompassing them in great shame. So taking up one's cross, stumbling as you carried that cross beam to the hill, it declared to the watching world that I am on my way to death. I no longer have any legal rights. My life is as good as over. So friends, if we commit ourselves to Jesus, we're handing control of our whole life over to him. We surrender our rights to him. We acknowledge his rightful claim over all that I am, all that I do and all that I have, over my very existence and all its resources. What a challenge if we're going to live for Jesus, if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus, the King, to deny ourselves and to take up our cross. And then Jesus says, and follow me. See, being a disciple of Jesus isn't just some momentary act. It's not like just walking into your final exams and walking out three hours later. No, no. But rather a constant, growing relationship of loving service to the Lord. Following Jesus is staking our life and hope on a crucified, resurrected, ascended King. You see, being Christian isn't some nice, convenient lifestyle that makes life easier. Nor is it some life assurance policy guaranteeing the future. Rather, it's a radical change where our life is never the same again. Following Jesus is costly. And so we're in constant need of refreshment and encouragement. That's why we're called to church, isn't it? To be nourished in our radical discipleship as we live for Jesus. Being a disciple means denying yourself taking up your cross and following Jesus. But Jesus goes on, doesn't he? He talks about our living in a very paradoxical way. When you first read it, it doesn't seem to make sense, does it? He says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his life, his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? This is a pretty radical profit and loss account, isn't it? Jesus spotlights what we value deep down. Do we cling on to physical life? even at the expense of our essential being or soul. He says, if I want to save my life, I must lose it. If we're prepared to lose even our physical lives for the sake of Jesus, then we'll save our eternal being. So Jesus' words confront our sense of identity, our sense of who we are, isn't it? It asks the questions at the very core of our being, of who we are, about the things not limited by time and space. Cultures, I think, the world over want to say that our true identity is tied up with things like a fulfilling career generating lots of money or solid financial security into the future or a good home in a safe location or a status where people look up to you. 
See, if we make those things, then the world says to us we gain real identity because we'll be recognised and appreciated. Sometimes our earliest experience involved receiving or witness, witnessing prizes for succeeding. And it sort of builds that expectation. And so it's easy to become performance-based and achievement-driven. But Jesus warns here, don't build who you are on what the world values. Because in the end, a performance-based lifestyle is unsatisfying. Even if we gain the whole world, it won't be big enough or secure enough to make us sure of who we truly are. So Jesus calls us to replace a performance-based identity with a real Christian alternative. It's a radical replacement. But we need to see our identity in Christ. To follow Christ is to base ourselves in him, on him. Our identity, who we are, must be moulded in him, in his gospel of forgiveness and life. It's like the, I think it's called millet bread that Alfred's been serving me. I'm not quite sure if that's what it is, but it's this big black lump. <laughs> but it's all moulded together. It's like you can't take it apart. You struggle to be able to separate it. But that's what it's like to be moulded in Christ. You're there with him, stuck firmly. Our identity is in Christ. As Paul says that if we're in Christ, we're a new creation. And friends, that new identity is founded in a crucified Christ. The one who loses his life so that you and I may gain eternal life. As we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus, then it'd be silly to negotiate with God, wouldn't it? You know, I'll obey, follow you, Jesus, if you do this one thing for me. Stupid, isn't it, really? <laughs> How do we negotiate with a God like that after he sent his son to die on the cross for us? No, no, we cannot negotiate with God like that because it does not recognise the king who died for us. The only appropriate response is to give him everything, to serve him out of grateful love and trust. That's the only response. We must die to the idol of selfishness as we commit ourselves to Jesus. We must renounce self-control as we trust Christ day in, day out. And that's what we're reminded of when we say God is good all the time, aren't we? Because we're trusting him every moment. Radical discipleship means we value serving Jesus more than our present life. That we invest in the gospel for Christ is known through the proclaimed word of God. Is that the case for you, friends? Is your true identity anchored in a crucified Christ? Are we willing to lose our life for Christ's sake and the gospels in order to gain it? But yet Jesus still doesn't leave us at that point in terms of discipleship, does it? Because the last verse of our passage reminds us of yet something more. Let me read it again. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes 
in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Jesus now is offering us a reality check in our public life. For those who are finishing university and moving out, the challenge is, are you going to be a Christian in your new environment? Are you going to stand for Jesus? Are you going to make sure that your Christianity doesn't become simply a private affair that's just on the inside? Because generally that's what our societies want around the world is to squash Christians out. To not let them have a voice in the public arena. But Jesus says here we must be prepared to stand up for him no matter where we are. Because in the end it is Jesus the judge that we're accountable to. He is the one that's returning and when he returns and wraps up this world order, everyone will stand accountable before him. But living unashamedly for Jesus is difficult. I wonder what tempts us to put our faith on the inside, to close the closet doors. Is it anxiety about life? financial worries? Is it our unwillingness to be out of step with our peers? Is it compromise driven by family or cultural expectations? What tempts us? Jesus' words remind us about a future certainty, his return. So are you going to live unashamedly for Jesus? with your families, in your churches, in your places of employment, in your relationships with your neighbours and friends, in your decision-making choices of your time and your energy and your resources. As we think about our university life together, are we seen as people whose words and actions are directed by the Lord Do we boldly stand for Christ as a Christian community, as the Uganda Christian University? Are we known for our bold stand for Jesus? Friends, Jesus demands radical discipleship. Governed not by our own interests, but by his and the gospel's. And so he calls us to deny ourselves to take up our cross and to follow him. But that life, of course, begins as we repent and trust in Jesus, isn't it? Friends, you can't be a disciple if you haven't taken that first step. And if there is anyone here today who has not repented of their sin and placed their hope and trust in Jesus who died and rose again, then don't leave this morning without talking to someone and be sure of your eternal destiny. There's plenty of people, look at them all over here, they'll love to talk to you if you're unsure about where you stand with the living God. There's nothing more important than being right with God. And so friends, if you are following Jesus, may your radical discipleship not be limited by your past, nor by cultural values or family expectations, but rather by Jesus, by the gospel. And may we truly encourage one another to live faithfully and may we be renewed by God's spirit to be radical disciples for Jesus. Let me pray. Dear God, we thank you again for your love in sending Jesus so that in his death we have life. In his return from death, we are assured and certain of that life. Father, help us to live faithfully as disciples of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.